views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Lebanon Hospital Center's Vice President of Planning, Marketing, and Public Relations, your co-host for tonight's Health Beat television program. We welcome you, our many viewers, and as always, encourage you to continue participating in the program by calling 718-960-7261 with any questions you may have. That's 718-960-7261, and we promise to do our very best to keep you medically informed and healthy by discussing the topics that are of interest to you. Please tune in every Monday evening from 6.30 to 7 p.m. on Channel 67. And you can also find out more information about Bronx Lebanon and its many community services online and at our website, bronxcare.org. Tonight, my co-host, Dr. Milton Gums, Bronx Lebanon's Vice President and Medical Director, and I will be discussing asthma, both in terms of treatment as well as prevention and control. Yes, Aaron, the incidence of asthma in inner-city communities such as Bronx, is um, uh, alarming and must, we must do everything, do everything possible yeah. to help our community understand what can, be, what can trigger it. Joining us this evening are three experts in the field, Dr. Diaz Fuentes, Chief Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine, Dr. Kaja, Attending Pulmonary and Critical Care, and Ebony Lowe, Practice Administrator for Adult Medicine Practice, Bronx Lebanon Hospital Center. Now before we hear from each of you, our panelists, let me once again encourage you, our viewers, to call in with any questions or comments you may have. The number to call is 718-960-7261, and please call us. Now Dr. Diaz Fuentes, let me start the program by asking you to provide our viewers with a general overview of asthma, as well as how it specifically impacts our Bronx community. Well. Asthma is really a global burden, not only in the United States, but in all right. the different countries. The incidence of asthma is anything between 1 to 18 percent in the population in different countries. Now, if we think in the United States, today there is at least 22 million people that is affected for asthma. 22 million 22 in the United States? 22 million people are, are diagnosed with asthma right. today. Every day, you have around 4,000 people that die of asthma. That is around 1 to 10 people dying every day right. due to asthma. So if you look at the family impact, this affects the society, this affect, affect the workforces, those affect the kids. Now, we live in New York. If you look at the prevalence and the incidence of asthma in New York City, compared with some other places in the United right. States, it's much higher and is higher in the South Bronx, when there are many studies looking at the incidence of asthma in the South Bronx compared with Queen, Brooklyn, right. Manhattan, and actually we have a higher number of asthmatic. There are more people that are being admitted for asthma. There are more dis um, morbidities with asthma, right. and the mortality is higher. So this affects all of us. Right. It's not only affect the person that have the disease, but affect all the family. Right. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Kanja, just what causes asthma? Can the contributing factors to it be considered as? Yes, what several you know? reasons to cause asthma. Could be hereditary and could be the risk factors like triggers which are being influenced by it. Could be indoor and outdoor. The ones which are indoor, you may like it. Like cats, dogs, they are your regular pets. And yeah. the ones you may not like it is the cockroach, dust, mites and mice. And outdoor, you have pollens, grass, and hereditary. Make it sure your, if your parents have it, then the child is high risk to have an asthma. So it is hereditary and uh, um, environmental. Yes. Yeah. Now, Ms. Lowe, perhaps now would be a good time for you to share with our viewers just what this asthma center at Bronx Lebanon is all about. What makes it unique? Sure. Well, we have a group of seven pulmonologists that are dedicated to helping the patient. And 
some of the patients come in with severe asthma and the doctors are dedicated to making sure that their asthma become controlled. We have a respiratory therapist on site that completes spirometry testing right. as well as asthma education and we also have a pharmacist that completes asthma education as well as assisting a patient if their co-payment for their medication is too high. What also makes us unique is we have a walk-in clinic every Monday afternoon from 1 to 4 and we have on Thursday afternoon as well. But we begin at 10.30 in the morning. Now what about your own role at the practice? My role is to make sure that the patient leaves with a smile, that they're happy, that their needs were met, that if they need any future appointments to get them in a timely fashion for them okay. to okay. help their care. How does an individual know if they're having asthma in the first place? In other words, what are the this, this specific symptoms Side of, and you know, signs. Well, you know that asthma can affect everybody. There is no the specific race or gender or age. So in general, the people that are more affected with asthma are the children, the girls, the women, people that live below the federal, federal poverty uh, yeah. um, level, they are more affected with asthma. And one of the problems with asthma is you don't have specific symptoms. In right. general, People with asthma is a chronic condition. You have chronic inflammation of the mm -hmm. lung. So especially with the change of season, with the pollen, they are going to present with cough. They are going to present with chest tightness. Sometimes they just say, I cannot breathe. They are trying to do exercise. They get tired when they do exercise. So in general, the most common symptoms are cough, shortness of breath, mm -hmm. wheezing, and chest tightness. The problem is sometimes the same symptom can be given by some other diseases. If you have an elderly patient right. with some cardiac problem, they can present the same. So it's very, very important to try to differentiate, yeah. you know, if this is asthma or some other associated But condition. that's true, but many people, many young people die of, of misdiagnosis from of asthma. asthma, of yeah. asthma. Yeah. Because so. some people feel like they are having a cold, right. and then in reality they are having asthma attack. For yeah. the time that they come to the emergency room, the oxygen level can be very low, and kids can die asphyxiated yeah. because of the asthma. Yeah. Right, which leads me to the next question, Dr. Katja. Yes. How do you and the staff actually make the diagnosis of asthma, and what are the long-term as well as the short-term, for that matter, treatment options? That's actually a very good question. So when the patient comes to us, what we do is a spirometry, which we do it in a clinic or right. which you do it in hospital. Right. And while we do the spirometry, we have a bronchodilator response. And if there is 12% or 200 ml response, then the hyperreactive airway is responding. That indicates that patient may have asthma with the reactive airway disease, which is responding to the bronchodilator treatment. And that's how we initiate it. That's the way we move on with asthmatics to say whether this right. is a reactive airway disease and responding to the bronchodilators. Okay, now let's go into more details regarding the types of treatment that are available as well as the effective effectiveness of some of these treatments. You want to talk about that? Sure. Now the, the treatment, the first thing is when you manage asthma, is not only the medication. The most important thing is because, like a Dr. Kaya said, there are so many triggers that can trigger asthma. Allergies, you know, pollen, dust, exercise, sometimes alcohol, especially beer or some type of wine that can trigger. Right, so the first thing in the management of asthma is the patient have to understand the disease. They have to learn what is asthma and what are the things that can produce the symptom. And then there Excuse are- Excuse me, we have a call, we're gonna interrupt you. Daisy, Daisy is on the phone. Go ahead, Daisy. Daisy. Hi, how are you? Good, what's your question? Um, okay, I have, my daughter, my daughter is a mild persistent asthmatic and she was on a regimen of medication, but because I don't like to keep her on so many different things um, and she's pretty under control right now, she's not on anything. But when the seasons change, she always has a little flare up. Is it recommended for me to give her everything at once, like all the different pumps that she's supposed to use, or just an albuterol treatment? Well, you bring an excellent point, and actually that is one of the things in asthma, that asthma change. 
rise or like you said when there is change of season or the pollen now the pollen has been in the higher side lately so sometimes they can be without medication or with very little medication for two or three months but if you notice that when the change of season come if your daughter is getting a little bit more short of breath or tight then it's time for you to work with the doctor and try to start giving some of the medication they used to control the disease before. You don't want to leave your kid without treatment because chronic inflammation of the lung can give her chronic problem in the lungs, right? So you need to work with the doctor and maybe this is the time of the year that maybe you need to add one or two extra pumps and then after the pollen season went down, you can decrease the medication. Okay. okay. Nice question. Mm -hmm. Thank you that very much. That was a very nice question. Yeah. Now, is asthma different in other parts of uh, the country and yeah. or even other parts yeah. of our state for that matter? Actually, one, it's very difficult to understand why we have so much asthma in the South Bronx compared with the other places. But one of the things is probably the pollution. The other thing is a lot of people live together in, in a very close space. Some, many of our patients sometimes move to Florida or move right. to areas where there is less sudden change in the in the temperature. So the area where you live, like a Dr. Cayo was saying, is very important. We are more exposed now to indoor allergies. So mm. we have the rouches, we have the dust, so, uh, people are smoking in the room. All these can trigger the asthma. Okay, on that note, we are going to pause for a short break. And when we return, we will continue our discussion as well as take calls from you, our viewers. Once again, the number to call is 718. 960-7261. That's 718-960-7261. And please call us. In this age of technology, Bronx Lebanon Hospital Center is advancing computer systems to benefit its patients and the community. What is really important is that the technology we provide is truly helping the community. And as a result, our physicians, nurses, and staff are really succeeding in optimizing patients' care and access as well as patient safety and satisfaction. Our staff relies on the comprehensive health information systems we have in place to expedite the registration process and make the appropriate medical decisions regarding treatment and follow-up care. At Bronx Lebanon, highly specialized care is being provided by an expert staff using state-of-the-art technology. Bronx Lebanon surgeons are also at the forefront of advancing technology. We certainly have cutting edge technologies in place, but what is especially important here is that we have surgeons, nurses, and technicians who deeply care about our patients. Bronx Lebanon's ear, nose, and throat department is also performing highly complex surgical procedures. We are bringing all types of technological advances to our ENT patients, including the latest in facial plastic and reconstructive surgery designed to achieve successful outcomes. And Bronx Lebanon's orthopedic team is keeping patients moving in the right direction. We have leveraged our own patient outcomes data as well as national studies to achieve the highest level of care in hip and knee replacements. Our spine, hand, and foot surgery as well as sports medicine programs continue to be of the highest caliber. Extraordinary is the best way to describe the sight-saving surgeries performed by Bronx Lebanon's ophthalmologists. We are using sophisticated laser and complex surgical procedures, as well as microscopic technologies to protect and restore vision. Bronx Lebanon is also delivering exceptional services for women. Its one-stop shopping approach means easy access to a wide range of general and specialized inpatient and outpatient OBGYN services. We provide women in the community with a luxurious birthing spa in a state-of-the-art labor and delivery unit and comprehensive outpatient GYN services at the hospital's new health and wellness center. When necessary, advanced robotic surgery and other related procedures are available. In the ER, we see some of the most dramatic examples of Bronx Lebanon staff and technology in action. Our expert and experienced ER team is helping patients overcome all types of emergencies. We are effectively using high-tech equipment to monitor, track, and evaluate a patient's condition prior to making the decision to admit, discharge, or extend their observation in our recently completed 11-bay unit. And technological advances are changing the practice of nursing. 
our nurses are fully prepared and eager to meet the challenges and benefits that technology has to offer. We are now using an electronic medical record which is providing nurses with the time to do what they do best, provide excellent care for our patients. Bronx Lebanon is also leading the way in anesthesiology, dentistry, family medicine, neonatology, neurosurgery, pediatrics, psychiatry, and long-term care. Welcome back to HealthBeat. We come to you live on BronxNet every Monday evening from 6.30 to 7 p.m. Please call us at 718-960-7261 with any questions you may have, and we will certainly do our best to answer them. That's 718-960-7261. Now, before we continue our discussion, we have a call from Alberto. Alberto. Can, can we hear your question? Yes, uh, thank you, Doctor. Uh, my question is, I'm a professional athlete, and I have a friend of mine who uh, wants to work out, and he has asked my, my question is, is, uh, is it something that I should do, something I should look out for? Um, Ex as that is, an exercise. that is an excellent question. I don't know if you are aware, but many of the famous athletes they do a FASMA, and it's very important that people know that. Now, in general, um, asthma probably one of the best exercise for asthma is swimming. But if people want to, en uh, you know, engage in running or everything, the first thing is you have to start slow when you start doing exercise. You need to start taking some of the medication before you do the exercise. You don't want to start doing exercise and then your lungs start getting tight and you are not able to breathe. So the most important thing is to take your medication on a regular basis, use your uh, rescue medication before you start doing exercise, and then at the end of exercise, don't just stop, but you need to, you know, you need to have a warm-up period, and then at the end of the exercise, you need, to, you need to keep going for a little short period of time, not to allow the, the lung to just close. Okay. Yeah. On that note, uh, let me move on to our questions. A question we often ask our panelists is to share their respective backgrounds with our viewers. And let me start with you, uh, Dr. Diaz-Fuentes. What interested you in pursuing a career in well, pulmonary? When, when I was in the school, um, back home, I'm from Chile, you know, I enjoy science and I enjoy biology. And then I wanted to be I felt like a medicine was an area where I could right. do an immediate impact in people. Right. So I went to medicine, I had a great mentor that was a pulmonologist, right. and then I fell in love with pulmonary. Right. And then we are here. Okay, now before we go to you, Dr. Kaja, we have a call from Diana. Diana is on the air, I believe. Yeah. Diana, you have a call for Dr. Diaz or Dr. Kaja? Yes, I do. Um, if construction is being done in your house, can that trigger asthma? If contraction is... Well, that's a very good question, Diana. It's actually, mm -hmm. yes. Any trigger which can cause your precipitation of your hyperreactive airway can cause it. So now you're exposed to the construction. Can you avoid it? No, you cannot. So the thing is you have to have your construction as well. So the things you can have it is while you're at work, have them do it or have your mask on while they do it. That's the best way to prevent and protect yourself from the triggers. Okay. Okay, thank you. And following yeah. through with that question, let me now ask you to share your background, Dr. Kaja, with our viewers. Sure, I'm from India. So basically, look, medicine is a very respected, a white collar thing. So what we all, our brothers and sisters, what we decided is uh, do something for the healthcare. Science was our passion. So we were focused towards medicine, all of us. Right. So we went through the medical school in India and then came to here. Right. So how many brothers and sisters do you have? Oh, I have six, basically. So are they all, all doctors? Uh, four of them are doctors. Okay. Well, that's good. Two of them went And lastly, Ms. Lowe, let me ask you to share with our viewers the rationale for choosing an administrative career. Sure, so upon completing my master's degree at John Jay, I. I got hired as a ambulatory care coordinator, right. and I would do patient flow uh, projects. 
I would also help the former practice administrator with various tasks and patient satisfaction, the former practice administrator for pulmonary. And I would see the doctors, Dr. Diaz, as well as the, the, her fellow colleagues, just so dedicated to the patients and just helping them in every single way. And so when the position came um, and I was offered, I gladly accepted. And helping patients was, was helping anyone was always a passion of mine. Okay. Perhaps you two can provide more detail regarding the prescription drugs used in, for asthma. Sure. So asthma is divided into two things. One, you have rescue medication. The other one is your controller. The rescue is the one what you, mean you by keep. rescue? I know what you mean, but tell us. The rescue medications which we have are beta agonist what and did, anticholinergics, did like example of albuterol. Right. You always keep in your pocket. And in necessary, in need, you start using it. Like you're in a shopping mall, you're in a movie theater, yeah. or you're in a place where immediate help can be reached. So you have your rescue medication in mm -hmm. your pocket. Then comes your controller. The controller is the one which is needed for all the time to c keep your asthma under control, which could be your short-acting uh, steroids, it could be long-acting steroids, and could be the other medications, which are leukotriene inhibitors also, you can uh, have it with you. Okay. Just to add what Dr. Right. Calle is saying, the controller is just to open up the lung yeah. when you cannot breathe. Yeah. But then the controller is you have a lot of swelling inside that decreases the swelling of the lung, so yeah. you will have less damage uh, going forward. So theoretically, you should have two things yeah. sort of two together. Yeah. ready. Yeah. Yes. Right. Now, in terms of the asthma patient, what type of situation merits uh, an emergency room visit, or even for that matter, a hospitalization? And what happens yeah. when the patient is hospitalized? Yeah. One of the things that the patient learn when they come to see us is they need to recognize when they are getting sicker. Right. You know, and there is something that we call asthma action plan, where it's like a, when you are driving, you have right. a green light, red light, yellow light. So you c they can measure the lung and they know when they are getting sicker. So if somebody is using too much rescue medication and that doesn't work, then they should be going to the emergency room or going to the doctor uh, to, to get assistance. Got okay. it. Uh, At what age does asthma usually present itself? Oh, it's, it's a very uh, difficult question, and, but the answer is very easy. At any age it can present. So it can, in the pediatric age group, the only thing is whether the child is missing the school or whether the child is waking up in the night time. The mother is the one who is going to help the pediatrician to guide how to proceed with the asthma. And it can come in any age groups, regardless of uh, either, either pediatric or the adult. But how do you know whether it's a asthma attack or an allergic beginning or continuation? So mostly the allergy symptoms overlap with asthma. They come on together. Mm -hmm. And usually the symptoms are not regularly. They vary during the night, during the day, during the season, and during <coughs> the uh, uh, going to school or at work. So they change. So depending on the symptom, you try to what at do you least. What mean by the symptoms? Like they can present with either just a cough, saying that they wake up in the middle of the night with cough, some of the patients may just say, I have chest tightness. And somebody say, yeah, I hear cats in my lung. I hear wheeze. Yeah. So depending on their symptoms, that's where we, they guide us how to proceed. All right. Now so a question we often ask our panelists is to share their respective patient success stories with our viewers. And I'm going to start with you, Ms. Lowe. Give us some uh, representative examples. I have many patient success stories. But one that really sticks in my head is just one patient came in could hardly breathe, needed to be placed on oxygen quickly. The nurses came to her, right. helped her with her, you know, put her on her oxygen. She was able to, we expedited her to see the provider to get her in and out. And she, she left better, though, not know, knowing that she didn't have to go to the emergency room that night or knowing that she wasn't going to be hospitalized. Right. Dr. You, uh, Dr. Katja, what about you? So there are like um, a lot of success stories at Bronx Lebanon Hospital. We do with excellence. So one of the young patients, like 18-year-old, she didn't realize that she was going to have an asthma attack. She just ignored it. Her chest tightness went up to so severe they couldn't breathe, she collapsed at home. Mm. And the emergency services had to be initiated. She came to the emergency room where then the intensive care was uh, called for. We took her to ICU. 
And then we put her on a nebulizer treatment and we gave her like uh, steroids. And subsequently, after a couple of days, that she was extubated successfully. And then she told doctor, I knew it was coming, but I wasn't taking my medication. Right. Okay. And Dr. Diaz, perhaps you can briefly share a success story with us. I, had, uh, I have a patient that she's an elderly lady with asthma, and she's a singer in church. And she started getting more and more asthma attack, and we realized that she was not getting the medication because the insurance right. didn't, right? right? So with the help of Ebony and the pharmacy, we got into the wrong medication, right medication. Mm. And I saw it around two months ago, and she was so happy because now she's back in, right. in singing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so those are things Good that stories. make your life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what is the relationship between emotional problems and asthma? We sort of touched on it before. Do you want to? Most pe a lot of people are emotional, so maybe you can tell us a little like bit. Like uh, with any of the other diseases, you know, emotions will trigger asthma. You know, when you are having a fight, you are having a good time, you are under period of stress, mm -hmm. that can trigger asthma. Your diabetes will get out of control. Your blood pressure will go out of control. Yeah. So emotions and, and stress are triggered uh, for yeah. asthma. Okay. Okay, now, Ms. Lowe, how can individuals get an appointment? at the practice? Um, they can call 718-992-BRONX or call me directly, 718-901-8140. Okay, and Dr. Gumbs, you want to ask a final question? Uh, what's that? Will there ever Oops. be a cure? I'll ask his question <laughs> for him. Will there ever be a cure for asthma? We hope so, right? In the last yeah. decade, there are so many improvements in asthma. Now we know that there is so much inflammation in the lungs, so they are making a specific medication for each patient. Every single with asthma patient is different. Right. So even we all have asthma, we are all different. So the medication that each patient needs right. have to be adjusted to the need of the patient. So we do hope that one day is going to be a cure. Yeah, yeah but that not seems... Not today, that not seems, today. That seems far yeah. off. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay, on that note, let me thank each of our panelists for joining thank with you. Dr. Yeah. Gums and myself on tonight's Healthy Television program. And most importantly, let me thank you, our viewers, for tuning in this evening. If you, our viewers, have any questions or need assistance, I encourage you to call our physician referral service by dialing 718-99-BRONX. That is 718 718-992-7669 or you can refer to our website at bronxcare.org. Good night, and we'll see you in two weeks when we will be discussing common foot problems. There's a shelter pet who wants to meet you. Meet one today. Visit the shelterpetproject.org. Adopt. There's a shelter pet who wants to meet you. Meet one today. Visit the shelterpetproject.org. Adopt. Hey, Ma. I got the job. I've got the job. Welcome aboard. I've got a job to do today. Have a good first day at work, Mom. Donate to Goodwill. Help provide job training in your community.